friends, Ginny D here, and 10 years ago last month, I made and wore my very first cosplay, which is super crazy to think about. It both feels like it's been way longer than that and like it was last week. Time is a construct. But I decided that since it is my 10 year anniversary and since cosplay obviously went on to become a really big part of my life, this would be a great time to try remaking that costume from scratch to see how much I've grown and how far I've come since then. So prepare yourself for a wild ride. I am gonna show you my embarrassing baby cosplayer Ginny photos and we're gonna whip up an entire costume to celebrate a decade of cosplay. Let's do it. travel back in time. The year is 2011. Bridesmaids just came out. Prince William and Kate Middleton are getting married. Adele had just released Rollin' in the Deep. It was a simpler time. Enter Ginny D at the tender age of 20. This Ginny had worked two previous summers at the local Renaissance Festival. I have a video all about that if you want to hear those crazy stories. And through Fair, I had met my first true dyed-in-the-wool nerds, who in turn introduced me to conventions. My 2010 convention season showed me what cosplay was all about, and I was really eager to join in. So in April of 2011, at the local science fiction and fantasy convention Starfest, I debuted my first cosplay. At the time, I was really into Felicia Day's web series, The Guild. If you haven't seen it, but have existed in nerd culture for a while, you've probably seen the music video, Do You Want to Date My Avatar, performed by Felicia Day as her character from The Guild, Codex. I loved this costume. And since I already had some sewing experience under my belt, I wanted to take on something a little challenging. So with the help of both of my parents, I started working on it. Down in their poorly lit basement, I sewed my first ever corset, I hot glued rhinestones to everything, I added ribbons to thrift store sandals, and I watched while my dad used dangerous power tools to help me assemble her staff. I even dyed my own hair red, partially because wigs scared me, and partially because I had just always wanted to be a redhead, and this seemed like a good excuse. When the day of the convention came, my mom helped me curl my hair, which I naturally documented on a point-and-shoot camera. Oh, 2011. I assume I attempted some form of makeup, although you literally can't see it in photos, which sounds about right for my level of makeup skills then. And I went to Starfest. It is impossible possible for me to look at these photos and not think about how awkward I look. Now that I have 10 years of cosplay behind me, I've learned about how to pose, how to hold my face, how to perform confidence even when I feel nervous, but 2011 Ginny did not know that stuff. Despite all of that, you will have to believe me when I say that the Ginny in these photos was a lot more confident than the baseline Ginny of the time. I felt awesome in this costume. I felt pretty, people were paying attention to me, they were taking my picture, they were complimenting my work, and best of all, a ton of people were really excited to connect with me about loving the guild. I had become this symbol of the show that we all loved, and complete strangers were able to unite over it, which was something I had just never really experienced before. It was completely addictive. From this moment on, I was hooked on cosplay. Of course, these days, cosplay means something totally different to me. I do most of my cosplaying alone, in my own house, in front of my camera now, and since it's part of my actual job as a self-employed creator, obviously my approach to it has changed a lot. And over the course of a decade, my actual crafting skills have evolved. So as we walk through my 2021 version of this costume, I'm gonna highlight some of the things I've learned over the last 10 years. And because I'm a nerd, I have given it a fun, alliterative name. So let's dive into the build, starting with the dress. The first version of the underdress I split into two parts, a dress and a skirt. And this was to try and generate some of that like full flowiness of the skirt. I have a little tool layer underneath for volume. <laughs> Looking a little worse for wear. A lot of mistakes I made here. One is that I had a gathered cotton at the waistband and that puts a lot of bulk at the waist. Also, the kind of flowiness that Codex's skirt has is not this kind of volume. It's not a gathered skirt. Her skirt is made from a few layers of a very pretty, very light chiffon. And to be honest, it's a lot shorter. 2011 Ginny was afraid of very short skirts, but 2021 Ginny has discovered dance tights and shed some of her puritanical upbringing, so I'm gonna try and do a more accurate length this time. So what I have here is a basic white satin and then a white stretch knit and some white chiffon. The first version of this underdress was actually really well fitted, so I'm picking it apart and using it to pattern the new one. One 
detail I missed in the original costume is that the bust actually has a layer of pleated chiffon over it, which actually makes a ton of sense for pulling it together with the chiffon skirt. For the shoulder pieces, I used interfacing in the first version, which was fine, but I want a particularly clean finish on these, so for this version, I'm cutting out some craft foam triangles and sewing them right in. On the original underdress, I used gold organza ribbon for all the trim, and that shit was itchy. Which actually brings me to my first... Holy shit, prioritize comfort over all else. Especially if I'm planning to wear a costume to a convention, which means eight, sometimes 10 or 12 hour days. And when I'm working as a cosplay guest, I often just don't get breaks. I can't just decide that I'm over it and ready to change back into normal clothes. And God forbid if I'm judging an 8 p.m. costume contest. If a material feels like it's gonna be itchy, I've learned to line it or change it. If I have a choice between accurate shoes and comfortable shoes, I will pick the comfortable shoes. I've learned that I'm the one making the costume, so I'm the only one who can make it easier to wear. I've basically learned not to torture myself. So with that lesson in mind, I am trimming this one in a nice, smooth, metallic spandex. I'm creating a seamless trim by applying it first to the front, wrong sides together, and then folding it back and doing some white top stitching just outside the trim to secure it from the back. Once I confirm the fit, it's time to add the skirt. We'll start with the chiffon. Since I want to avoid the bulk of that pleated waistband from the first version, I'm going to create a half circle skirt instead. I use circle skirts all the time now because they're just so easy to pattern. Plug your waist measurement into an online calculator, figure out how long you want it to be, and you have an instant skirt pattern. Hemming circle skirts already kinda sucks, and hemming chiffon is worse. But thankfully, I have learned another Invest in the right tools. Part of learning and growing as a crafter might be mastering difficult techniques, but another part of it is just learning how to work smarter, not harder. Why force myself into learning to make a perfect tiny rolled hem by hand when I could just get a rolled hem foot? A key part of investing in the right tools is also making sure that I'm learning about the right tools. 10 years ago, I didn't even know what a rolled hem foot was. Self-educating and being open to trying new techniques is super important. If I hadn't watched tutorials, read sewing blogs and books, and attended local sewing classes, there are so many ways I would be making things harder for myself. Once I've made and hemmed my single layer of satin and two layers of chiffon, I am basting them all together and then adding them to the dress. Next, I'm adding some rhinestones. These are from the same rhinestone batch that I used on the original costume. Keep your leftovers, kids. And the only real difference is that I'm applying them with E6000, an industrial adhesive, instead of hot glue. Don't get me wrong, I still use hot glue a lot, it's super convenient, but my first version of Codex has just shed rhinestones over the years, so I want to make sure these are really secure. I finish it off with a zipper in the back and the underdress is done. The fact that I made a fully boned corset for my first cosplay and it actually came out okay is frankly a miracle. I've made probably a dozen corsets in the decades since using both commercial patterns and self-drafted patterns from my own measurements, and I still don't think I've mastered them. Interestingly, in the first version of this costume, I didn't know enough about corsets to even recognize the difference between an underbust and an overbust corset. Codex wears an underbust, and the corset I made was an overbust. This time, I'm making a more accurate underbust corset. So for this corset, I am using a free pattern from Aranea, Aranea, Aranea Black called Allie. Her website has a bunch of downloadable printable corset patterns and tutorials. I like just found it and I'm super excited about it. Step one when making any fitted garment, but particularly a corset, is also another. 
make a mock-up. It's basically an unfinished version of the piece, sewn together just enough that I can try it on and make adjustments to the fit if I need to before I cut into my actual fabric. There are many benefits to mock-ups, but the main one is that I decrease the risk of something going wrong while I'm sewing the final garment. I can basically work out the kinks beforehand and make the actual sewing process less stressful. They're especially useful when I'm using an expensive or difficult to find fabric that I really don't want to mess up. I'm not gonna lie, mock-ups are a pain in the ass. I always want to just get started on the garment itself, and a mock-up often feels like a waste of time. But the number of times I have messed up something obvious or easy because I was in a rush are beyond counting. After 10 years, I think I've finally learned that investing a little extra time upfront in preparation will save time and headache in the long run. This corset pattern comes with instructions on how to grade between sizes, which is great because a corset has to be very fitted and most people's bodies are not the same as other people's bodies. In my case, I took my measurements and my underbust measurement is between sizes C and D. My waist is between D and E and my hip is between A and B. Hips, we don't have those here. To start, I'm tracing the pattern pieces onto my own paper so I can include both the grading between sizes and the proper adjustment for my own torso length. You guessed it, this is another save, custom, or customized patterns. Once I learned how to adjust patterns or create my own, I sometimes found myself reinventing the wheel, drafting the same basic bodice pattern or hunting for a good base for a sleeve over and over and over again. I'm kind of embarrassed at how long it took me to just start neatly transferring my customized patterns to paper and saving them. If this corset pattern works for me and I want to use it again, there's absolutely no need for me to waste time in the future going through all of the steps of grading, lengthening, cutting, mocking up and tweaking this pattern a second time. Instead, I can just tuck these modified pattern pieces into an envelope for the next time that I need an underbust. After the pattern is ready, I'm cutting it out of a scrap, non-stretch material, and then sewing all the pieces together to end up with a mock-up of how the final corset might fit. I've laced it up roughly so I can try it on and see what changes need to be made. This is unfortunate because it laces up pretty straight and it fits me pretty well, but it's supposed to have a two inch gap in the back. I'm not sure how my measurements could have been that far off off. Maybe I did my seam allowance wrong? But I can imagine that if I cut two inches off the back, that it would fit pretty much perfectly. I'm also marking where the top and bottom of the corset should be to match the cut of Felicia Day's original corset. The cool thing about a mock-up is that it's totally disposable, so you can cut it, mark it with a sharpie, sew over it, do whatever's helpful without worrying about destroying it. Okay, we're in version two of the corset mock-up. This one seems like it's gonna be better, so let's try it out. Oh, this is so much better. Look at that. That's nice. Just a note, if I really wanted to make the perfect corset, I should bone my mock-up and I should use grommets in the back. That's the only way to get a really accurate picture of how the final pattern will look. But ultimately, since I'm not sewing for a client or being tested on my sewing expertise, I get to choose how far to take my mock-up. And for me, this is enough to move on to the actual corset. By the way, full disclosure, there's like a midpoint to my own codex arc that I haven't talked about yet. And that's that I have worn this costume since its debut. A few years ago, I did get a wig for it, and my makeup and posing skills had improved, and I made a second, somehow maybe worse version of her staff, which by that point had broken, and I did all of this in order to meet Felicia Day for a photo op at DragonCon. Meeting her in this costume was absolutely wild because most of the people in line to see her were Supernatural fans. And after photos with a string of people wearing Supernatural shirts or Supernatural cosplays telling her how much they loved her in Supernatural, her face just like lit up when she saw me as Codex. It was surreal. I feel like you can see in my eyes that I was overwhelmed and trying really hard not to fangirl. I look like a weird blank eyed robot. If you've never done one of these photo ops, they really rush you through. You have like milliseconds. So she actually asked me to come by her table later so that she could get a photo of me, which I think she like Snapchatted or something. And the craziest part of this story is that years later, just a few months ago actually, when I was telling patrons about this build, one of them told me that they were at a book signing event and she like mentioned me? I completely lost my shit. I actually didn't believe it at first. I still remember hearing Felicia speak at a local bookstore and talk about meeting you in costume. What? Talk about meeting me in costume? Probably not. She's met a lot of codexes. She mentioned you by name, so I think she meant you. What? She what? What? Why? Why? What? That's crazy. Ugh. She had the pick of the two of you and everything. She talked about how much she loved seeing people as Codex, and then you are her fan. 
I always feel guilty when somebody praises something I've done that I know is flawed. So I'm not gonna lie, part of my motivation to rebuild this cosplay is to better deserve the esteem that Felicia apparently holds it in. Another thing I totally ignored in my first version of this costume was the type of fabric on the corset. Weirdly, her actual corset is made from corduroy, which is a strange choice. My first version was just made from a pretty red fabric that I found, but since I'm trying to show off how much I've grown with this one, I want to try it with a more accurate material. Turns out, it's very hard to find red corduroy. My local fabric store does carry a thick striped corduroy in a color called Persian red, but that color is a little more magenta than I want. Thankfully, one of the skill sets I've picked up over the years is... Discoveries. Do not fear dying. I used to think dyeing fabric was such a huge deal. It scared the heck out of me and I would often rather use an inaccurate or even difficult fabric in order to get the right color. I initially learned fabric dyeing for my Arya Stark costume because if there's one thing that Joanne Fabrics just straight up does not carry, it's desaturated browns and that's basically all that Arya's costume is made of. But once I started experimenting with dyeing, I learned that it's actually not that hard. As long as I pay attention to the fiber makeup of the fabric, I've had a lot of luck creating specific colors or cool gradient effects with fabric dye. And since color can be so crucial to a costume's recognizability, it's a skill that's really come in clutch over the years. I know from the color wheel that since this fabric is too pink, I should be able to bring it closer to a true red by adding yellow. Thankfully, this fabric is mostly natural fiber, which means regular old writ dye should do the trick. But just to be sure, I start by dyeing some swatches. Once I'm confident that I'm getting the color that I want, I add the whole yardage into the pot. Once it's dry, I am ready to start sewing. Since the pattern is already done and ready to go, I can jump straight into cutting up the corduroy and starting to sew it all together. As a fun little nod to the first version, I'm actually using the same red fabric I used on the original corset as the lining for the new one. God, I hang on to scrap for a long time. Midway through putting all of this together, I stumble upon a problem. My busk is too long and I only have busks in one length. I do not have the tools to cut this, but I sure as heck don't have a source for a new one. So I guess it's not gonna have a busk closure. At first, I'm really frustrated by this realization. It's 11.30 p.m. at this point. I don't really have time to order a new busk and wait for it to ship. But then I think about it from a new perspective and I realize that even though Codex's original corset has a front busk, that feature actually makes the white front panel kind of hard to execute. In my first version of this corset, I attached the white panel on one side permanently. It's just stitched to the corset. And then when you connect the busk, you can then flip the white panel over and secure it with a bunch of tiny little snaps. To be totally honest, when I look at the original Codex costume, I don't like that you can see that the front panel is detachable. I don't think that it's aesthetically pleasing. Which brings me to a be intentionally inaccurate. I used to think that accuracy was the beginning and end of a quality cosplay. I spent years striving for accuracy, even at the expense of a cosplay being comfortable or affordable or flattering. But the fact is that I am not Felicia Day, and even if I made everything about this costume exactly like hers, I would not look the same in it because I'm a different person. There are already going to be things outside of my control that make this costume look different on me than it looks on her. As soon as I learned to let go of that fixation with accuracy, I started making costumes that I liked wearing more. In this case, skipping the front busk will actually let me attach the white panel directly to the front of the corset, allowing for a better fit and what I think will be a more attractive final garment. But before we can get to the front panel, I have to finish sewing the lining to the corduroy, adding the boning channels, and inserting the flat steel bones. I've closed up the top and bottom with a quick zigzag stitch to hold everything in place while I add the grommets and lace it up for a final fit test.
You know, I think it's pretty good. The fit feels right. I actually love this corset pattern and I'm definitely planning on using it to make a more generic corset that I can pair with other costumes. If you've ever thought, wow, I just haven't found a pattern I like yet for this, don't give up. It's been 10 years and this is the first time I've found a corset pattern that I actually really like. I like almost don't want to take this off. It really is very nicely fitted. I'm proud of myself. Fits, nobody wants to see your anus. You're gonna be in the way if you stay here. I need to make that white panel now. Are you gonna stay there? Are you just gonna take a seat? Is this where you live now? The ideal way to make this white panel if I'm not using a busk would be to incorporate it into the fashion layer. Literally just make the front section of the corset out of the white fabric instead of the red. But since I got really far into the corset before I made that call, I'm making it as a separate piece and just applying it over top. Maybe I'll finally get it right in 10 years when I'm 40 and making this costume again. In any case, I'm making a separate piece, then I'm stitching it to the corset and applying rhinestones to it. And binding the top and bottom with the same gold spandex that I used to bind the underdress. And that completes the corset. Codex's staff is such a fun prop, and since this will be my third time making it, I hope that means it'll be easier. My original staff was one inch PVC, and looking at the references, I just think it's too thick, so I went for three quarter inch for this one. My main goal here is that the newest staff be both sturdy and capable of breaking down, so that it'll be easy to travel with. I'm gonna start at the bottom because it's pretty straightforward. It's a horizontal piece of one inch PVC, which I have cannibalized from the previous version of the staff. I scraped off the hot glue, removed the red gems, and sanded it down. Now I'm using the Dremel to basically carve the bottom of one of my PVC fittings to allow it to fit over that bottom piece. Once it fits, I permanently attach it with E6000. Now it's ready for a fresh coat of gold paint before I add the red gems from the first version of the staff back in. So I pulled these gems out of the previous staff. They were a little beat up, so I painted over them with a coat of nail polish. Next, I'm moving on to the top, which is sort of the focal point of the staff. There's a big green orb and a set of gold wings that frame it. In past versions of this staff, I've used foam core for the wings, which is easy to cut into the right shape, but ultimately very fragile. This time, I'll be using foam core as a base, but finishing it with warbler to make it stronger. Another fun fact about the first version of the staff, when my dad and I were working on it, he was like, do you want it to glow? And in the show, it doesn't actually glow. It's just a green ball. But like, who wouldn't want a staff that glows? My dad had some LED lights lying around and he knew how to rig them up with a little switch. And it was just a fun little detail to add. So for this version, I am paying tribute to my dad's electronics nerdery by making it light up again. I got these little lights. You can't even really see them on the camera because they just look white. They're green. I picked up clear plastic ornaments to use for the orb so that I can put lights inside of it. I'll cut a little gap in the plastic near the base so the switch that turns the lights on and off will be accessible from the outside. Might break them, but um, I bought the ornament balls in a pack of 10, so I have a lot of chances. I've already spray painted the insides of the ornament with a mix of two green paints to create a subtle swirl effect. Now I'm gluing the LED switch into place and closing the lights as well as some tool to help diffuse the light inside the ornament. Next up, to make it come apart into pieces, I've picked up some PVC fittings and I'm starting by cutting the PVC into smaller sections. 
each of those sections will be disguised in a different way. The midsection of the staff is wrapped in black leather, which makes it a perfect place to hide a fitting at the top and a fitting at the bottom, allowing the staff to separate into three separate pieces. To make the leather wrapped section even, I have first glued some craft foam to make the PVC about as thick as the fittings. Then I cover it with a strip of black vinyl pleather. For some unknown reason, in both versions of this staff so far, I have hot glued the leather on and it just always looks messy. So this time I am doing the obvious thing and I'm just hand stitching it. You know, I think that's also a Sometimes hand sewing is the best answer. I spent a long time thinking hand sewing was something that you fall back on when you messed up and sewed things in the wrong order. I saw it as something to avoid as much as possible. But the truth is that hand sewing is a valid and useful technique. There are a lot of contexts in which sewing something by hand is going to be better looking, easier, stronger, or even all three. Next, I'm going to be working on the rounded, sort of donut-shaped rings on the staff. On the original staff, I used napkin rings for these like rounded bits. Most napkin rings, it turns out, are one inch. Robbed of my napkin rings hack, I have to figure out a new way to do those parts. The Guild actually released a series of videos in which they documented the making of the Codex staff, and they used epoxy sculpt for these rings, and just a bunch of power tools. Interestingly, one thing that I did have access to for the first version of the staff, but don't have access to now is power tools. Technically, I could just go to my parents' house and use theirs, but it isn't always convenient. So in some ways, I'm capable of less now than I was 10 years ago. What I settled on doing is sculpting the rings out of polymer clay over a core of aluminum foil. They're not going to be perfectly even or smooth, but I feel like this method gives me the most control over the size and shape, and I'm hoping that once they're just a part of the whole, their imperfections won't be too noticeable. Now that I've cured them in the oven, I'm just sanding them down to try and give them the smoothest possible finish. Then I'm gluing them into place on the PVC. In hindsight, I probably should have carved slots for the wings into one of the rings before curing the clay, but whoops. Anyway, I'm doing that now and gluing the wings into place. Now all that's left is doing the gold paint and putting it all together. I'm masking off the parts that I want to stay white. I did do some base coats of white primer beforehand, by the way, to cover up the printed stuff on the PVC. And I'm just gonna do a few coats of metallic gold. Finishing touches. I am using hot glue to tack down some hemp cord on the leather wrap section. Next, I'm using acrylic paint and a small brush to fill in the red insets on the wings. And finally, I'm gluing the orb in place at the top of the staff, making sure the switch is accessible but not too visible. The staff is complete. At this point, the costume is nearly finished. All that's left are a few small accessories, most of which can be at least partially cannibalized from my previous versions. I'm starting with the jewelry. For the headband, I am keeping the base, which I've already picked all of the hot glue off of and freshened up with a new coat of paint. Now I'm applying new rhinestones, this time, you guessed it, with E6000 instead of hot glue for more stability. I'm using similar tactics for the necklace. I've pried off all of the little decorative bits from the first version, and I am applying them more stably to the new version. I'm also replacing the rhinestones on the necklace with some that are slightly better sized. These aren't really steps, but I wanted to also mention that I ordered gold bracelets for the armbands and a ring for this costume. In the music video, there are a few scenes where you can clearly see Felicia's ring, which is a clad out with a green stone. I had originally glued a green rhinestone to a cheap ring base, and when I met her at DragonCon, she seemed surprised that I had included it in my cosplay. Apparently it's just her ring, not actually intended to be a part of the costume. But hey, she wears it with the costume, so I upgraded that to a more accurate ring. Plus, it's pretty, so I don't mind having it. I'm also remaking the bracers, although the first pair was honestly fine, other than the itchy organza binding. I just want to make sure that the materials match the new costume. They're basically just slightly widened interface satin rectangles with gold binding and grommets.
Last but not least, this costume has some pretty fancy shoes and some knee pads if you don't consider them to be part of the shoes. I honestly did a pretty good job on these the first time. I attached some ribbons to a surprisingly accurate pair of thrifted sandals, and my biggest mistake was just making the knee pads in two separate parts and having a bunch of different pieces tied together behind the knee. So this time I'm directly referencing how Felicia's shoes come together at the back of the knee. That is two gold elastic bands. To achieve that, I am sewing the red and gold knee pads. The red is more of that same corduroy from the corset. And then sewing two long tubes of gold that I can case the elastic in. I'm stitching the gold and red knee pads together, which is another big combine items to make them easier to wear. You know those shirts that were really popular in the early 2000s where the collar and cuffs of a button down were stitched to a sweater so you could look like you were wearing layers but actually only be wearing one? I try to bring that energy into my cosplays now. There are so many instances where making something look layered will result in a costume that's easier to make and easier to wear than actual layers would be. I've worn way too many costumes where certain pieces just didn't stay in place and I was constantly hitching them up or pulling them down. Now I've learned to just put it where I want it, and then permanently apply it there. Full disclosure, to finish up the shoes, I wrapped the ribbons around my legs, tucked them into the knee pads, pinned them, and then sewed them in place, and this was a mistake. I thought it would be pretty straightforward to just hold the ribbons in loops and put the shoes on, but instead, it turned putting on the shoes into a very confusing and stressful puzzle. At some point, I will probably unstitch the ribbons from the knee pads and just add some snaps. And with that, the costume is finished. Let's see how it all looks together. That's it! It's done! I felt really good in this costume the first time that I made it and put it on, and I feel really good in it now. There's something about this costume that just makes me feel like cool and powerful and like beautiful and... I don't know. I would like to think, and I have no idea what's going on in Felicia Day's head, but I would like to think that she too felt like cool and powerful and beautiful in this costume. I've come so far and my life has changed so much over the last decade. Like unrecognizable. And I think it's good to occasionally just give yourself a reason to really look back on what you've experienced and just like think about it. It can be so easy to not think about it just moving on day to day. There have totally been ups and downs in my experiences cosplaying and creating content online. I'm not gonna act like I have it all figured out now or like I'm the best I'll ever be or like I'm sure about where I want to be, but I am Oh my god, I'm like getting emotional. I am just like really grateful that like 2011 Ginny decided to take this chance and just like do something that was out of her comfort zone. I'm just like proud of her. <laughs> of me. To those of you who might be considering starting cosplay, I would really encourage you to try it because maybe in 10 years you'll look back and be like, hot damn, I'm so glad I did that. Okay, that's it. Like, share, subscribe, etc.